My scholars, it's an honor for today to be able to uh, introduce a gentleman who, thank goodness we have our IT gentleman here, D here, because Jason Burmis is going to be with us in a couple minutes. Um, he's giving me the confirmation, we've talked several times, and he's looking forward very much to addressing our class. I'm just seeing if you can send me a message. Ah, cool. Burmis just sent me a Skype, sent me a message saying, yep, he's on Skype as we speak. Uh, all the work that he's done uh, from change, and you know, I think one of the biggest things that really shocked us was the way that you handled the TSA up at the Albany Airport. <laughs> <laughs> also, the debate with popular mechanics blew us away. Hey, Jason, sir, um, can you let us know, man, like, how did you get into this aspect of citizens' journalism or citizens' media, and what is that to you, man? To all these students, what power do they have, you know, exercising their First Amendment right? Well, I think that's the, the biggest thing. You know, we kind of live in a society right off the bat that, that tries to convince you that you don't have any power, that you're just kind of a cog in the machine, that there's this cookie cutter mold of what you need to do and what you need to be and what you need to believe. And I'll admit, you know, up until probably six months after 9-11, I was very stuck in that mold. And, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of an older guy. You know, 9-11 happened when I was 22 years old. I just turned 35. But I remember feeling very uncomfortable. And uh, I'm an upstate New York guy. I was going to a state university here. Uh, a lot of my friends were from Long Island, from the city. There was kind of panic on the streets that day. And I, and I remember thinking to myself, man, I, I worked nights at, at the time. So I it was a Monday night. I probably went to bed at like 6 in the morning. And uh, one of my roommates came into my bedroom and he said, the towers are gone. And I just was kind of blown away. I was like, what are you talking about? I didn't quite process it. I went downstairs. By this time, both of them had fallen. I'm watching it on television. To me, initially, the very first feeling I got was, well, it looks like they blew those towers up. But that was all put into the background. The way the media changed that day, I... It's very hard for me to even explain to you guys because it's literally, you know, 14 years ago now. And the, what happened was that day, every single station, you know, it wasn't 500 cable stations. At the time, if you had 100, 150, that was a lot. Every single station was news, everything. VH1, MTV, 24-7 uh, for almost a week, okay? And they drove it home from the very first hour I watched television, though, Osama Bin Laden was behind this, and it was Al-Qaeda. And uh, I really didn't question it. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, to me, the biggest questions going around at the time in the mainstream and the days and months after, and the ones that I thought, you know, again, because I'm watching all this media, I immediately got hooked. I was always kind of into history and politics and, uh, I would say, trying to explore knowledge. But the internet at this time was kind of brand new, guys. I mean... In the 90s, it was nothing more than message boards and AOL. So in the late yeah. 90s, when people were starting to post things, there weren't all these big news websites. News was a little bit behind. You know, there were these forums and kind of like hack shacked places where you could find information. If you were smart, you could find some stuff. Uh, you could go on what were file sharing networks. You know, everybody hears of legendary Napster. But there was things like Nutella, Kazaa, Morpheus. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of LimeWire. I was using this type of software yeah. to actually get raw news footage back then. And, and I'll admit, I'm not your average guy in that respect. I'm kind of an info junkie. I want to see things. I want to get things. I want to have all perspectives. Uh, you're a wealth of knowledge. You're an inspiration to us. I want to turn the mic over to some of our students who, you know, I've been fascinated with you, brother, for the last week and a half since we've been discussing everything you've done. Scholars, so just throw a hand up if you'd like to get a question in. We'd love to have one or two. Tyler, Jason, we have one of our students. Tyler here. Yeah, Ty, please, brother. Or Ty, maybe even like right here, bro. Right yeah. here. Yeah, all right. Jason? Can you see me? Yeah. Nice. Such an honor to talk to you. Thank you so much. I've, I've watched a lot of your films. I've seen what you've done. You're doing like the right thing. Just so much respect for you. Thank you so much for being here and talking to us. Um, anyway, so I've done a ton of research on like all this stuff, and um, I have a two-part question. Just so what I've been able to do is I've been able to like tell people about it and try to get them to research. But what else can we do as like a people to like not be able to like 
Because if you look at the future and what, like, it looks super scary what they're trying to do with the New World Order and all this stuff, what can we do to stop that? And what do you think will happen? Do you think it's actually going to happen? And do you think there's going to be an uprising? Or what are your views on that? All right, so, big question. There are lots of things. First of all, never succumb to fear. I don't live my life in fear. Uh, even though I sit here and I do do a lot of research, I comb news sites, I want to see what's going on in the world of geopolitics and uh, technology especially, uh, I'm still watching every Simpsons on every Sunday. I'm still <laughs> hanging back, playing with Borderlands 2. I'm still going to the movie theater. I work in a bar, okay? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I can drink with the best of them. Uh, not too much. Everything in moderation, man. You need that sort of thing. You know, I still like to go out on dates with girls. You know, I, I like to have a normal life. But, but, a normal life can include, you know, something like this to, to keep an eye on people. You know, you don't even have to have something like this. The truth of the matter is that this is, this is like six or seven year old technology here. And, you know, 70% of that is now in this. Okay, so you can make a difference, and things do go viral that you would not expect. And they don't go viral all the time, and you are gonna have to work hard. You know, I worked my ass off, man, and you know, some of my stuff sticks, some of it doesn't, but it's always out there for people to see, you know what I mean? So I think that's what's important. So I, I think it's, you gotta ask yourself, what are your strong points? First of all, I always tell people, the number one thing you wanna do is inform yourself on whatever you're trying to talk to people about. Uh, you know, when I was talking earlier about all those file share networks, well, this predates YouTube. You know, this is before Google was the number one search engine. So what was I doing? I mean, you couldn't even burn DVDRs. I had 700 megabytes CDRs and a CD burner, and I was burning literal news clips and had little uh, notepad documents of what to look for originally in Nylon before I even started doing these movies. And then when hard drives got... <laughs> A little bit cheaper. When software got a little bit cheaper, that's when you know the movie stuff started to happen. And uh, you know the camera behind me—it looks like a still cam. It shoots like a 35 millimeter movie camera. So the potential is out there, man. And that thing's like a $700 camera. Probably get it on Craigslist for 500 bucks. It's very cheap to do. It's really about willpower and the ability also to, to manage your life. You know what I mean? Again, you have to. Yeah, I, I, don't get me wrong. To be successful in anything, I think that you have to have a bit of obsession over it. But I try to obsess on doing the right thing and being oh, a Jason, better person. I this think is that, one of our scholars from Southern California, Camilo. Hey, Jason, how you doing? Good, man. Uh, like you said, my name is Camilo Arias. I am from Southern California. Uh, my question is, do you believe that George W. Bush set up 9-11 to make his presidency look better than what it was turning out to be? I don't think the guy was going to have to be quite honest. Um, see, that that's kind of the confusion when you point fingers at entities within the government. I think there needs to be internal investigation. The first person that I would indict is, of course, Dick Cheney for some sort of compliance in the attack based on Mineta's testimony. Okay, and then you go from there. George Bush, for those that don't know, he wasn't even really set up to go into politics. George Bush was a, was literally the son. Uh, he has two other sons, Neil and Jeb. Okay, Neil was set to be the politician. However, he got into a huge savings and loan scandal uh, in the 80s, which made him almost the Bernie Madoff of his day was the other Bush son, for those that don't know, is Neil Bush. Now, Jeb Bush, uh, a little bit younger, they are able to get him into office. He's in the governor's seat of uh, Florida at the time of Bush's presidency. Before uh, Bush's presidency, he was a one-term governor. And before Obama, we, we have, literally have the presidents had the least amount of political experience. You are experience. too much. Thank you, brother. Um, no this is Amy, and Amy has a question for you. Hi, I'm Amy. I'm from Britain. I have the question about Jimmy Savile. I want to know what your thoughts are on him. Well, I think, number one, after he died, it was harder to silence everybody. I mean, the, the, the massive amount of victims that succumbed to him, uh, it, it's pretty mind-blowing. However, anybody who studied this subject, and especially in America, there's something called the Franklin Scandal. There's two books about it. There's the Franklin Cover-Up and the Franklin Scandal, and it went all the way to the White House. Now, for those that don't know, other people that have been indicted and arrested on these things are people like uh, Gary Glitter, who was an 80s pop star. Everybody's heard that song when they go to a sports game. It's da 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 Hey, okay? These people are still being arrested. All right, brother? All right, people are yeah, running. Sounds good. Thanks, man. Uh, Jason, we have L here. Uh, another great question. 
Hi, I'm Al, Al Um So what I've noticed a lot is that you kind of, you make it clear that something is going on. You're making it clear that there's a lot of conspiracy, a lot of underground information being put out. But you're never really, like, what I've seen is you're not really stating your opinion of what the main idea of it all is. Like, what's your opinion as to what's actually occurring? Because you have a lot of information. You're saying all these things are occurring and they're all interconnected. But what do you think is actually going on behind the scenes? I think that there is a powerful conglomerate of people that are trying to work to globalization, to uh, unfortunately a, a cashless society where the population can be controlled. Not everybody, you know. When I talk about these people, you know, I, I hate using generalizations. I like using quotes and information. For instance, people like Prince Philip, okay? Prince Philip's been around for a long time. He's still kicking. Uh, it's Charles's father. It's Queen Elizabeth's husband. This guy's openly stated on record, it's in my latest film, Shade, where he wants a culling of about 80 to 90 percent of the population. Other people like uh, Ted Turner, who are extremely powerful. Yeah, this is in they shape. Want him uh, off. They want more manageable populations. He talked about how he wanted a 90% population reduction, and he didn't disagree. It's in, the, it's in the film. And then he also said, well, we could bring it down to about 2 billion. Well, there's 7 billion people on the earth. And no matter how much of a nice, you know, upper middle class life you live, you're still the same guy that I am. It's a poor guy. They don't, they don't look at us. They look at us as a monetary class mostly. So if they're planning on wiping out all these people, I mean, they're not going to do it in you know that incrementally. There'll have to be some kind of swift thing because no matter how much disease is out there, no matter how many people die of cancer, our population keeps going up. Okay, and and I think that there are a group of people that are now trying to consolidate world power and unfortunately reduce the population while taking over what I call not a technocracy but a technopoly. Because if it were a technocracy, that would mean that other people could get into the mix at the upper echelons. And that's just not the case because every time somebody does, even the Elon Musk of Tesla, you know, this newfound billionaire, I think the guy's awesome. You know, I may not agree with everything, but he's warning people about the dangers of AI. He's trying to make electric cars the new thing. He's trying to take our dependence off fossil fuels, which is really a, a huge tool of the old oligarchy, standard oil and more. Um, you know, if they can control, for instance, how much you pay for things, in other words, the energy you consume with things like smart meters, well, they control a huge aspect of your life. We, we have a great, we're in the first world. You know, a lot of people don't. So what I see is there are, there, there has been a plan for, you know, again, these royal royalties have been around for a long time, and they've always tried to take more and more and more. And a lot of these people really just want to consolidate it at the top. They want their new world order, and unfortunately, a lot of us are not going to be a part of that. Or ten for gas. Before all this. Okay. Jake, brother, we got about thirty seconds, and I got to get all my scholars out of here because they have other classes, and I want to hold them. I just want to thank you, sir, for your time for your dedication to being a great, not only American, but a great global citizen. On behalf of our scholars here at Menlo College, we thank you and we applaud you, sir.